and do the end of chapter of section three. This is kind of uh, the Devil's Pulpit. It is a series of Reverend Taylor's sermons, reportedly, according to the uh, narrative. And if you look at the introduction, there is a link to this actual page that I'm on. And you can actually download the PDF of this if you want. And I am reading it uh, section by section, and this is where we last left off. It should be the fourth video in the playlist, I believe. Um, basically, the last video right before this is called The Devil's Pulpit Part 3 to page 46. Reverend Taylor. We are going to read the end of this and then the next chapter part of that. So thank you for joining me and uh, if you want to hear this from the beginning the playlist link will be below and take care. Okay so hence also the word crest or Christ upon all their tombstones naturally associated itself with the idea of the resurrection and was hieroglyphical to the same purpose as the Latin Rusugam, I shall rise again. Thus the phrase Jesus was crucified means nothing but the Son which was crucified, while in all Kabbalistical jargon of the epistle of St. Paul, your observance will perceive that he never makes the mistake of confounding the resurrection of Jesus with that of Christ. For he can only prove Jesus to be the Christ, that is, the Son by the fact of his rising again. These eternal risings and settings being the proper and essential definition of the Son. Thus, sir, I think it must be as clear as the sun to all who would not turn from the sun and prefer the darkness to the light, and idle idiocy, folly, and faith to learning reason and philosophy, that I have done what I took in hand, that I have brought down such a stream of science upon the stable of Bethlehem, as has washed away the accumulated ignorance of barbarous ages and cleansed your hearts and minds from all respect for the gospel as a history or for those stupid bunglers who have mistaken it for a history and having once made the mistake would never endure to have their error corrected or their information extended. Now it looks like this might be footnotes but I'm not positive. It says religious distinctions, whatever was the common complement of language and the worshippers of Jupiter and Juno and all the riffraff gods and goddesses of the Pantheon were called Christians and were as really so as those ill-natured bigots who pretended a distinction where there was never any difference and would allow nobody to be good fellows but themselves. As you may have read, it parodied in our common churchyard stave. Go home, dear friends, dry up your tears. Here we shall lie till Christ appears. And when he comes, we're sure to have a joyful rising from the grave. And... Here we are up here at 47, page 47. As your own experience attests to you this day, how difficult and how daring a thing it must have been in any age for the better informed, the wise, and the discerning few to attempt to stem the tide of popular prejudice or to say nay to falsehoods, however gross, or to delusions, however monstrous and mischievous, Whence once the propagating of those falsehoods and the keeping up of those delusions 
has become the source of distinction and emolument to a selfish and a wicked priesthood. When you see with your own eyes and witness with your own observance how savage a madness, how cruel and bitter a spirit, your own Protestant and dissenting clergy, the most enlightened of the enlightened and the most liberal of the liberal, as they would be thought to be, do endeavor to excite against any man who would attempt to make the word wiser. Then it is convenient for their ignorance that it should be when you see the slanderous arts, the mean, the cowardly, the defamation put forth their lying boxes where they know that no man may answer them a meanness and a cowardice, which in no other case could man's uh, noble nature condescend to all, all to protect the guilty craft, all to throw bars across the path of knowledge, all to evade discussion, all to shirk out from that collision of mind with mind to which I challenge them, and which alone can strike forth the sparks of genius and light up the day of reason among men. Were there one priest or preacher in all this miserably priest-ridden metro metropolis, only one of the thousands who warn their chows and sheeted congregations not to go to the rotunda, who had dared to trust himself or them to know what is going on in the rotunda? Were there one of the thousands who affect to treat our astronomical argument with scorn, who could show that he had ever trusted himself so much as fairly to look at that argument. I would say that man is honest, but such a man is not to be found in Israel. The chapter in which these sermons were preached And we're on page 48. The conscious felon shudders, not more at the confusion that threatens him in an impending cross-examination than your Christian clergy shudder at discussion. Every other argument against their system has in some way or other, well or ill, been answered, but never, never this. Of this, as the ghost of bank, the flagrant demonstration of their deep iniquity, they have only said, they only can say, take any shape but that, and of the three discourses on the star of Bethlehem. Now we read an interlude chapter, John the Baptist, the devil's pulpit and a bonny pulpit it is. John the Baptist's sermon preached by the Highness's chaplain, the Reverend Robert Taylor, B.A., at the Rotunda, Blackfriars Road, November 27th. So if you notice, each of these come approximately seven days apart. That says November 27th, 1830. That is before the Civil War in the United States. And this reverend, is, these are his, what he's preaching. So here, let's go. In those days came John the Baptist preaching in the wilderness of Judea and saying, Repent ye, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Matthew 3, 1, 2. John the Baptist, John the Baptist, how do you do, Johnny? Where do you come from? Who are you when you're at home? What do you mean by making ducks and drakes of people by sousing them a horse pond? What do you mean by the kingdom of heaven being at hand? You'd have told us, I suppose, that the kingdom of heaven was in your breeches pocket. Had you worn such a superfluous 
article of dress, but remnant of camel's hair, and leather and girdle about your loins is all you care for, the pomps and vanities of this wicked world. By my honor, Johnny, I do admire your piety, but I blush for your modesty. In those days came John the Baptist. And what days were those? Preaching in the wilderness of Judea. And what wilderness was that? And if it was a wilderness that he was preaching in, what sort of congregation must he have had? But the squirrels and the rabbits and the monkeys and the chimpanzees and the orangutans and the wild beasts and the wild men of the... And we got to go to the next page. Hang on. The woods and everything that was wild, as sure as he must have looked wild enough himself, with no shoes and stockings and nothing else but an old mat of a camel's hair, tied with a strap of leather round his body and nothing to eat but wood lice, grubs and maggots and locusts and wild honey, so that his very victuals were wild. And if faith, if his doctrine wasn't quite as wild when he told the wild things to repent, because the kingdom of heaven was at hand, God, if the kingdom of heaven had been at foot, I dare say the wild fellows would have been wild enough to have kicked it like a bladder from one end of the wilderness to the other, till they kicked the king out of the kingdom, and so had a radical reform with a vengeance. So it was well with the thought of Bajani to cool him down, a little bit by dipping them in the water and when they began to shiver and they began to shake they mostly like we been to repent and bring forth all that Johnny was preaching for fruits meat for repentance for he must have wanted some fruit very badly but where the meat was to come from I cannot guess did ye ever hear anything so impicious and wicked in all your days? It's quite shocking. It sets me off all of a Twitter. Mock sermon. And back then in 1830, they didn't have Twitter. <laughs> okay, I'd add that in. Mock sermon delivered in the style of the Reverend Doctor. And is this the way in which we are to treat the oracles of omnipotence, the law of everlasting truth, God's most holy word, whereby however lightly we may affect the treat it now our souls will assuredly be judged at the last day and assigned to the eternal happiness of heaven, or to have their portion with devils in the everlasting torments of hellfire, according to, according as we shall have believed or disbelieved its solemn truths. And is this a subject for levity and ridicule, my brethren? Is a profane joke, an impious sarcasm, a mere lash of wit, an exhibi exhibition of idle buffoonery, to shut our eyes against the things that make for our eternal peace? and to pervert our souls from the faith of that divine Savior who came to seek and save that which was lost in all and of all. Persons next to our blessed Savior himself, who would have thought that it would have been the holy man, that self-denying personage, John the Baptist, that would have been fixed on as the butt of profane ridicule. That John the Baptist, who is so distinctly mentioned in the 18th book of the Jewish Antiquities of Joseph, the 17th chapter of the book, where his whole history and his circumstance of having been beheaded by the younger Herod, 
is related in such entire accordance with the facts detailed in the Gospels that to deny or to doubt the reality of his existence is to outrage all principles of evidence and to fly in the teeth of the history, philosophy, and reason as well as scripture. And why should the testimony of Josephus, a Jew, an enemy of Christian faith, as he is known to have been so clear and explicit, so positive and full of to the proof as it is of the circumstance of the death of John the Baptist, leave us in any doubt of the reality and actual occurrence of his preaching in the wilderness of Judea, resting as the credit of that occurrence, does on the authority of the inspired word of God? For if we receive the witness of man, the witness of God is greater. And that witness is that this is he who was sent in fulfillment of that prophecy of the ev evangelical prophet. Behold, I send my messenger, which shall prepare thy way before thee. The voice of one crying in the wilderness, Prepare ye the way of the Lord. Make straight in the desert a highway for our God. That this man should enter on his divine embassy with such appearance of humility, mortification, and self-denial as should show that his soul was set on a higher objects than things of time and sense, that salvation was his end, heaven, his home, and God his shield, and his exceeding great reward. Therefore came he baptizing with water unto repentance, exhibiting in his own abstinence abstemious health, a diet, and unostentatious apparel, the example of humility he taught, the moss his bed, the cave his humble cell, his food, the fruits, his drink, the crystal well, his life one constant scene of calm repose. Hang on. Oh, this is a mock sermon again. No pulse that riots, no blood that glows. Still the sea, air, winds were taught to blow. O oh, moving spirits bade the water flow. Remote from man, with God he passed his days. Prayer, all his business, all his pleasure, praise. And was this a character to be held up to impious ridicule and scorn this man this bright model of all was transcendent in goodness all that was sublime in virtue all that was exalted in moral excellence to be set up in features of caricature and effigy and desecrated by a vile buffoonery of exhibition as a but for the hand of scorn to point its slow, unmoving finger at. Say, Christian, say, whether shall one be more astonished at the impiety of feeling, the immoral, immorality of sentiment, the obtruseness of understanding, or the depravity of heart, or that unhappy man who would thus pour contempt on everything that is sacred, desecrate everything that is holy, dash the pure cup of Savior's love from his untasting lip and wage wild war upon the God who made him gobble, 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 gobble. End of the mock sermon. So, so, and with such fetch as this are we to be put off the scent of curiosity. And to go home like good boys and girls from a very fine sermon and never want to know anything more about John the Baptist? How facile is that to be eloquent? Where sound will do instead of sense? How easy to be a fine, pre very fine preacher in a very fine chapel with very fine fools to preach to? And where, when the minister happens to know no more about John the Baptist, 
Then the pulpit, the congregation, have no more wish to know anything about him than the pews. But here I trust we are curious creatures, and through Abamalik, with his blue beard, may lock up his blue chamber and guard it with ten thousand blue devils, will not be frightened from our criticism, will have a peep into it, though hell itself should gape and cry, Forbear! We have the... Word, the form of conjure conjuration, the key of the mystery, I will use it now. John the Baptist, I conjure thee by God, that thou appear, appear, appear. Yes, thou a spirit of health, or goblin damned, bring with thee airs from heaven, or blasts from hell. Be thy intents, wicked or charitable, thou comest in such a questionable shape, that I will speak to thee. The pretended distinctive testimony of the historian of Josephus to the real existence of John the Baptist vanishes in a moment before the eternal evidence of his derivation of the story from the very legends from which it has passed into our Gospels. The authority is therefore no more a distinctive or additional one than an additional copy of the New Testament would be an additional authority. Joseph himself evidently deriving the story from the Chaldean Braos, who describes an amphibious animal under the very name of Onus, half man, half fish, who came out of the Red Sea and appeared in the neighborhood of Babylon. In the reign of Eloras, uh, the first Chaldean king, who preached to the first race of all men all day and every night, dipped back in again, and his native element, the sea, and thus acquired the name John the Dipper. This is Morris's History of Hidden Stand, Volume 1, page 418, which he's quoting from, I guess, or citing. The authority, then, is one and the self-same in both. We are thrown back on the unsupported and unabetted claims of the gospel story, story merely for all that can be adduced for the existence of such a person as John the Baptist. Now, if I shall appear from the unsophisticated, unstrained text of sacred writ, taken in the most literal, obvious, first sense, and common sense meaning of what is called the original Greek, that no person as John the Baptist ever had a real existence, that the evangelists themselves, whoever they were, never meant a real personage, nor had reference to any events that ever happened upon earth, if I shall turn out if it shall turn out that I can show you what it was that they hang on, really did mean, and whence it was that their real meaning was derived, I shall stand entitled to your verdict, as triumphing in the challenge, which I have given to all the preachers of the gospel in the metropolis. In that I charge them with being deceivers of the people, inasmuch as they are dunces, and I am not one. They do not know the meaning of what they preach, and I do. Now then, to our business. Now to the proof of this. Give me but the measure of attention which you owe to learning which you owe to your own character as rational beings, and let not Christian savages invade the rights of man, and so withhold from me your conviction as long as you possibly can do so. I will not woo it from your courtesy, nor win it from your favor, 
but I will make it mine by right of conquest. In those days came John the Baptist, Mark I, the indication of the infinite indefiniteness and remoteness of time in those days. Yes, there were giants in those days, and it came to pass in those days, as St. Luke has, set, has it, such as precisely the form of beginning the most avowed and declared stories of witches, ghosts, or hobgoblins. Once upon a time in those days, that is not in those years, in those months, or in the reign of any prince that ever reigned on earth, but in the days of Herod the king, as Christ is represented in the twelfth chapter of this gospel, as saying, from the days of John the Baptist until now, the kingdom of heaven suffereth violence, and the violent take it by force. Where the phrase of it, from the days of John the Baptist, if it had any chronological reference, could refer only to infinitely remote antiquity, and be synonymous only with such a sense as from the beginning of the world, or from time immemorial, or as I shall show you, f that from the days of John the Baptist, that is, from the 24th and 25th of June, which most literally are the days of John the Baptist, which you will find in the Tropic of Cancer, cancer from that point downward, the Kingdom of Heaven does suffer violence. The days having reached the longest at the 21st of June, the reign of the tender lamb of March, the harmless bullock of April, and the pretty children of May is no more, but the violent lion of Ju July, the snake in full chase after the virgin of August, the hideous python right over the scales of September, the worm that never dieth of October, the blue devil of November, and all the other sons of violence do take the kingdom of heaven by force. They seem to pull the sun from his attitude lower and lower, till dread winter spreads his latest gloom and reigns tremendous over the conquered year. You will observe, too, that John the Baptist and his baptism could by no possibility be bought within the associations of the idea of any nation as those ascribed to Moses. They could not have even imagined such an imagination as that of rendering themselves acceptable to God of Moses by setting aside the peculiar peculiar mosaic institution and substituting the innocent folly of baptism? A John Baptist could not possibly have been a Jew. Had there ever been such a nation as that of the Jews? Which I shall hereafter show you to an absolute demonstration that there never was the name of the Jews. Hebrews, Israelites, like that of the Freemasons among ourselves, designating and meaning only those the fanatics of whatever nation they might be, who had been initiated and passed over or up to the highest rank in the greater mysteries of Eleusius in Greece, or those of Isis in Egypt, and who consider themselves as our Freemasons at this day do as a peculiar people, a holy nation, scattered throughout the world. Observe again, in those days came John the Baptist, but the Greek text has not the word that could be fairly translated, came. <clears throat> it is not, and I can't read Greek, but which is an astronomical word signifying in Latin ad fuit, that is, he became present. He made his appearance. Now, 
it is of the most of more consequence that no liberty should be. This asterisk at the bottom says this origin of the Jews agrees with the assumption of Moses in explaining the mysteries or teaching the truth to the common people by denouncing idolatry. Idol Jews mean a learned body. Okay, so it doesn't mean the same thing as an organized religion. Okay. Hang on a second. Guess, oh, my foot's falling asleep. Okay. Taken with the sacred text, but that we should adhere to the most severe liter, liter, literal ity of it, as I invariably do, come what will on it, for those these twelve good reasons, first, because it is not said and appears not to have been known to this evangelist where John the Baptist came from, he had as good a right to tumble down from the moon as the other had to tumble up again, as he was certainly sent to prepare the way of the Lord and to make his path straight. Second, because his appearance was not that of a human being, you would not have taken him for a human being had you seen him. Third, because his food was not such as could have sustained the life of any human being, and whether he came from heaven or hell, and supposing his meat was nothing else but locusts and wild honey, he must have lived in a continual purgatory. Fourth, because his dress wasn't decent. Fifth, because they said of him that he had a devil, that is, that the devil was in him. Sixth, because Jesus himself said of him that he came neither eating or drinking, and sure, if he could live without eating and drinking, the devil was in him. Seventh, because Herod the Tetrarch said of him that this is John the Baptist whom I beheaded. He is risen from the dead, and therefore mighty works do show forth themselves in him. Eighth, because Christ himself said, and sure it is very hard when Christians won't take the word of their own Savior and treat us as infidels for showing him more respect, respect than they do, Christ has said, and never said, he anything more positively and solemnly than this John the Baptist, as they called him, really was none other than the prophet Elijah come again, who, 900 years before, had been carried up into heaven in a chariot of fire with horses of fire, which accounts for his keeping so near the water's hedge, in order that the chariot of fire and the horses of fire should be after him again. He might be ready to duck under and so give those red-hot race horses a chance to cool their metal air they could catch him. Tis strange, methinks, that one who had certainly been to heaven once should take such pains to show us that rather than go back again, he'd be ready to drown himself. Ninth, because St. Luke says that he was in the deserts until the day of his showing up unto Israel, where certain it is that no man, woman, or child could possibly live. Ten, because the name St. Luke explicitly says that he grew and waxed strong in spirit, that is the most literally he lived upon the wind. Eleven, because when Miss Herodis, the boarding school young lady at the Lord Mayor's Ball, had danced herself into an un 
gented flusteration and wanted something to drink, she said, Bring me here, John, Baptist's head in a charger. And she said, and her mother drank it off between them. "'Twas monstrous, cruel of them to serve John the Baptist so. But I believe John Barleycorn gets served every day quite as cruelly. And if they'd bring us his head in a charger, there are very few of us who wouldn't be ready to commit quite as bloody execution on him. And sure, it but ill becomes them who eat and drink the body and blood of Christ to turn up their noses at a pint of John the Baptist. Um, I don't know if you all know this, but a charger is a like a silver or gold plate that you put under fine china, and it it's um, it's an elegant way to set a table. And so when they're saying put it on a charger, it's like a plate. It's a it's a metal plate, but it can be used under china. Okay, so let's read the next chapter of the section. I mean. Okay, so, twelfth, because when the question was fairly put to him, and demanded as fair and explicit an answer, Who art thou? And he confessed, and denied not, but confessed, I am not the Christ. And they asked him, When then art thou Elias? And he said, I am not. God forgive him for giving the lie so plumply to our blessed Savior who positively declared that he was. Art thou that prophet? And he answered, No. Then he then said they, Who art thou? What sayest thou of thyself? He said, I am the voice. Yes, he was the voice. Voice. It pre now, a voice and nothing but a voice. Now. So now the mystery begins to clear up a bit. As Jesus is expressly called the Word, and John, the voice. The devil's in it, if the voice and the Word are not first cousins, all the world over. And now, we can account for his being so fond of wild honey. For the doctors say, that that's the finest thing in the world for the voice. And sure, sirs, it will never do for Christians to do accuse me of levity and sarcasm for speaking of a voice with out a body where their whole system is founded upon. So very near a relation to the voice without a body, as is their divine logos, the world, without the word, the word without a meaning. A barbarous people, and never be it forgotten that all the religion in the world is derived to us from barbarians and savages, could sincerely believe that they had something like sensible evidence of the real existence of a voice without a body. When the echo of the priest's voice, while the priest himself remained unseen, pealed through the wilderness and bowery alcoves of the gods on their affrightened ear. And as the priests in all the ages and countries were well aware, there twas the very secret life, and chartered of their craft to let nobody speak but themselves, the echo of their voice passed for the deity himself. And thus, through our Old and New Testaments, you will find that God, who is often enough spoken of as a, the invisible God, is never once spoken of as an inaudible God. He cannot be seen, but he can always be heard. He has no body parts or passions, only he has the lungs 
of Stentor himself. He does not send forth his voice, yea, and that a mighty voice. For these twelve reasons, then, added to the reason that runs through them all, the reason of common sense and common honesty and truth do, I advocate and myself invariably adopt the severest literally uh, literality of the translation, not warping a syllable or an accent either to the right or left on one side or the other for any sense whatever. I follow the throw up of the very letter whether it may seem to make sense or nonsense, whether it lead me to heaven or to other place. It is not then the correct reading that John the Baptist came preaching in the wilderness, but that he appeared, the term is not historical, but astronomical. He was in the deserts as Luke has it, but what brought him there? You must look again before you'll guess at it. He was in the deserts until the day of his showing up unto Israel. It is not in the power of language to put an astro astronomical enigma more astronomically or for the solution of such an enigma to be more distinct than this. The constellation called John the Baptist is in the wilderness that is quite lost and imperceivable to the eye in the general wilderness and jumble of confusion which the starry heavens present to the illiterate and unscientific eye which can make neither head nor tail of them but falling into distinct method and most beautiful analogies, as soon as you shall have acquired the art of grouping them into the figures which they represent and looking for them in the seasons of the year when they appear above the horizon, then John is no longer in the wilderness, but you will distinctly recognize him in the zodiac at the season of his showing unto Israel when he appears as the genuine, as the genius of the month, January, Aquarius, the water bearer, who comes baptizing with water to repentance, says our English rendering, but to animadversion is the meaning, that is to, to change of mind. This is to put the mind up to the trick on it, that this is not history but science. It is the acquisition of which you will be able to very soon to solve every problem of the gospel, to read off from the face of heaven the bright interpretation of its dark sayings, to untangle all of its confused mysteries, and in the proud possession of the kernel of science, you will trample its husks and shells under your feet with joy and liberty of heart, which science only can give. With this clue, the whole science in our hand, let us catechize this John the Baptist. Now, my boy, what's your name, John? Who gave you the name? Why, your old friend, the angel Gabriel, when he appeared to my daddy, the parson Zacharias, and said, Fear not, Zacky, for thy wife Elizabeth shall bear thee a son, and thou shalt call his name John. But his mother's neighbors and cousins said unto her, There is none of thy kindred that is called by his name. And they said, Well, the footnote down here says, And what is the meaning of the name John, by which none of the, your kindred, race, or nation have ever been called before Ionus? It discovers to us three grand animatum radicals. One I own E S the Sun, the being, the fire. The name of God the Son, 
that is, of the son of the sign of Aquarius, who pours a stream of water into the mouth of the great southern fish, and hence the name Johannes, Johannes swallowed the fish, and the fish god Johannes of the Chaldeans, the Matsa Avatar, or the first incarnation of Vishnu, in the form of a fish of India, the Jonas of Phoenicians, the Ionis of the Greeks. So these are the footnotes. Now let's scoop over to the the top here. So what they're saying is that there's allegory that's been passed down from generations and it's based on astronomy. The science of the stars. Let's continue. Page 60. As well they might, what manner of child shall this be? And I should have been quite as much pestered to think what manner of woman. Old Betsy, his mother, who had not the holy oracles of God in the 16th chapter of the Gospel according to St. James, informed me that Elizabeth hearing that her son John was about to be searched for took him up and went up into the mountains, and seeing a mountain that she took a particular liking to, she groaned within herself and said, Oh, mountain of the Lord, receive the mother with this child. And immediately the mountains being, I dare say, pretty sharp set, opened his mouth and swallowed the old woman and the boy both at a bounce. The old woman was completely digested, and nothing more should we have heard of John the Baptist, but that it pleased Almighty God that it should be so. The mountain was seized with labor pangs, and St. John the Baptist was born again. The mere ceremony of the baptism would never ensure our salvation unless it be attended as it was in the case of the Baptist himself, with the death unto sin and a new birth unto righteousness, to which the wonderful fact our Holy Church alludes in her incantation of the 24th of June, which is the festival of the nativity of John the Baptist, Almighty God, whose providence thy servant John the Baptist was wonderfully born, and sent to prepare the way for the Son, our Savior, by preaching of repentance. Now, sirs, the solution of this repentance, what does it mean? I'm sure that your clergy and preachers of the gospel either don't know, and so are the dunces of ignorances, ignoramuses, which I suspect them of being, or if they do, they're the first fiends of imposture and deceit, and palter with you in a double sense, keeping the word of promise to your ear, to break it to your hope, repentance, entire change of mind, that it's coming to understand things in a wholly different way, the reverse and direct contrary in every respect from the notions you had imbibed from your stupid nurses and your lying priests. We're speaking in Greek here, I have to skip over it, are the words of the astronomical Hierophant, delivered as the prologue, to a tragedy, of which the imagined scene was the heavenly Jerusalem, of which the characters were the personified genie of the twelve signs of the zodiac, of which the plot was the representation of the great phenomenon of... Uh, so, I'm going to skip over the footnotes, I'm getting kind of tired. Okay, so the phenomenon of nature in the form of speeches and character in the ideal history of the birth, parentage, and education, trial, conviction, execution, last dying speech, and con confession of the Son, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried, and all the rest on it of which tragedy the prologue is spoken by a fellow dressed up after the fashion of Jack Frost, with a pitcher of water under his arm and camel's hair 
with a leathern girdle around his loins, the prologue being the words of our text. That is, amnivert ye, turn your minds now to the astronomical significance, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. That is, this performance, which I have the honor of announcing on you, is no matter of human history or of real occurrence upon earth, but it is the kingdom of heaven in pantomime, pantomime, yeah, of which I, Jack the Water Stone, am coming to admonish you, and my cousin, who will perform the character of Jesus Christ, will I hope go through the dying scene with such effect as to ensure your future patronage, his benefit being fixed for the 25th of December and mine for the 24th of June. And sure enough, sirs, if you turn the calendar in your prayer books or your almanacs, you will find that the church really has fixed the festival of the Nativity of John the Baptist on the 24th of June from which day downward to the decline of the year, the days grow continually shorter and shorter, for while from the 25th of December upward they grow longer and longer. And you have thus the key to the, that conundrum. In the first of St. John Gospel, where the infant Baptist, as the genius of the 24th of June, says of his cousin, the infant Jesus, the genius of the 25th of December, he must increase, but I must decrease. And he actually does decrease till nine weeks and three days after, that is the 29th of August. He gets his head cut off by the line of the horizon. And that day our church has fixed as the festival of the beheading of St. John the Baptist. Now, it says here, John the Baptist is beheaded on the 29th of August, because at the 14th hour of the half day, the bright star of Aquarius rises in the calendar of Ptolemy, while the rest of his body is below, and a direct adversary of Aquarius is Leo, for whom I've shown to be none other than King Herod. So Herod, every 30th of August, at half, after two in the morning, annually repeats the operation of cutting John the Baptist's head. So it's not literal, it's figurative. And therefore, with the most mythological accuracy, is the birthday of John the Baptist fixed so near the sun's highest point of the ascension, because that point really is not merely figuratively, but physically the mountain of the Lord, and so let's get to the next page. John the Baptist, as we have seen, was by his second birth the son of the same self mountain. Mountains in all ages, not merely figuratively, but physically, being famous for giving birth to echoes. And what was John the Baptist but an echo? a voice, and nothing but a voice, as we read from the 40th of Isaiah. The voice said, Cry, as he said, What shall I cry? But I say, You may cry what you please, but I shall cry. It is no go. But observe, I pray thee, great enucleation, the character of priests, and of priests of all religions, has ever been the same. From the days of the remotest ages, the priests usurped themselves the sole and exclusive right of addressing public assemblies, and they were the first theatrical performers, a monopoly, which you do see with your own eyes. They would, if they could, still keep up, the most fanatical evangelical of them, not blushing to preach against theatrical entertainments, and to warn their hearers not to go to any other playhouses but their own. Hence, the first forms of religion were perfectly theatrical. The first theatrical performances were tragedies, 
and the first tragedy was the gospel. The first performers, or tragedians, were called or hip hypocrites. That is persons acting under a mask and having an under sense and different understanding of themselves or the shows they exhibited to the people. Thus, all our priests to this day are hypocrites and all the religion in the world is nothing but hypocrisy. Of this fact, you find the gospel itself. Bear witness in that Christ, the manger of the strolling company, repeatedly addresses the chief priests and preachers of the gospel by their appropriate title, ye hypocrites, that is, ye players, or gentlemen of the buskin. The first plot of the story, the tragedy from the name, the ode incantation of the goat, is derived precisely from our gospel, is found to be an allegorical pantomime of the sun's annual passage through the twelve signs of the zodiac by those who reckon the year to begin from the winter solstice when the sun is at the sign of the goat while those who reckoned the year beginning at the vernal equinox when the sun crosses the line with the equator and appears in the sun of the the sign of the lamb whose ancient Ammononian was the name god which has become our English god oh gad god okay goat god gad The same tragedy or spell of the goat under the varied name, but not varied significant, say, Gad spell or God spell. That is the ode or incantation of the ram, the oldest written tragedy, which has come down to us, the Prometheus Desmots of Achilles, admitted, been acted in theaters in Greece 500 years before our Christian era presents with us precisely the same story, the story of the crucified God, and opens with precisely a similar first scene. The scene is the wilderness. Enter the demons of force and strength to them. Mercury, the messenger or forerunner of Jove. Now this is written in Greek on the top. I'm I'm going to have to skip over that, and at length then, to the wide world's extreme bounds, to Scythia are we come, those pathless wilds where human footsteps never mark the ground. But where does our poor Johnny in the gospel pick us his locusts and wild honey? Those pathless wilds where human footsteps never mark the ground. Why, as thus sirs in the ancient Arabic constructions of the zodiac the lion of july was depicted with a bee which the arabs ingeniously call the honey fly flying into his mouth and john has to do in the new covenant what his predecessor samson had done in the old to kill that is to overcome to come over the lion and so to take the very victuals out of his mouth, which gives us the real solution of Samson's famous riddle. Out of the eater came forth the meat, and out of the strong came forth the sweetness. So there was the honey for him. And sure, I need not explain to you how necessarily the honey that was torn out of the throat of a wild beast would ever would be very, very wild honey. And there is a locust enough for him in the scorpion of October. And why are all tw of the twelve apostles spoken of as twelve poor fishermen? A scaly set of them, I admit. But as you see, Ares is the first. The fishes is the twelfth of them. And they are all of them eternally running after the loaves and fishes than which nothing can be more apostolical. And why is it that all that they live godly in Jesus Christ must suffer persecution? 
but because as you see they are all of them eternally running after one another and no sooner shall you see one of them getting a little bit up in the world but you shall observe another rising in the horizon immediately under him ready to give him a somerset for his highest point of elevation and pitch him to the devil and here sirs we have the solution to the astronomical enigma which what has so puzzled the chuckle-headed critics upon sacred writ who are called commentators but whose brains for all wit that was ever in them might as well have been made of common potatoes immediately after the tribulation of those days shall the sun be darkened and the moon shall not give her light and the stars shall fall from heaven and the powers of the heavens shall be shaken a catastrophe which we will actually witness at this day as the natural result of the tribulation not of any persons that exists or ever did exist on earth but the tribulation of those days the days have been persecuting one another so that our sun is darkened scarce a moonlight night or twinkling star appears to make us amends for the chill foggy day and the very power of the heavens to fertilize our earth again seems to be bought in doubt but immediately after the days shall be shortened as on the 21st of December they shall have reached the shortest they shall appear this then shall appear the sign of the son of the man in the clouds in heaven with power and great brightness and there you shall see immediately after the shortest day emerges the constellation of the water bearer who is the son of man the baptist of the zodiac with his sharp frosts eating up the grubs of larvae of insects and might be fatal to incipient vegetation and pledging to the grateful faith the pleasing hope that through though for a season grim horror around our cottage rain yet spring will come and nature smile again and sure I may say in the same sense as it was said by the astrologue of the gospel there be some standing here that shall not taste of death until all these things be fulfilled nay he adds with peculiar emphasis verily I say unto you this generation shall not pass away until all these things be done but done such things never were nor could have been in any other than the astronomical sense in which they were done every year of our lives which sense they who reject will find that they have as great miracles to work to save their Savior as ever their Savior wrought to save them. The end of the discourse on John the Baptist. Until next time, thank you for listening, and uh, appreciate each and every one of you. Take care. Bye.